In Victorian England, fishing all manner of filth, detritus and human body parts from the Thames River in London was not such an unusual affair. Used for centuries as a dumping ground and waste disposal, it became so bad that by the mid-19th century it was renamed the Great Stink. In 1879, a coal porter pulled out an old wooden box and unearthed one of the more macabre treats the river has tossed up over the years when he opened it to discover a heavily mutilated body. The mutilations might have been somewhat notable, but far more so was the killer, who once tracked down was found to be a woman, a fact that rocketed it straight into the spotlight of public attention. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark Histories Season 5, Episode 12, I, ho- I think. I'm sure it is 12. I hope we're all okay this week. I hope this episode finds you all well. Thanks very much for downloading. I'm Ben, as always. Before we start this week, I just do have like one very quick um, thing to mention. Um, if you've been trying to contact me via Facebook, at the moment I'm having quite a bit of trouble with it. Um, I've been... We, are all sorts of mess um <laughs> so yeah the facebook messaging is turned off at the moment um it was turned off actually because i was getting a little bit behind on messages um but then fa- we got jailed in facebook for i had reasons i have absolutely no idea about what nothing controversial gets posted up there um so i guess for some reason it just something flagged it and uh yeah we got jailed um and so things have been turned off like comments have been turned off for a while and and all stuff like this basically basically what i'm trying to say is it's probably best not to use facebook if you want to contact me um at the moment because it's it's just a a nightmare um one way around that is of course the email and stuff as always all the links are in the in the show notes but obviously we've also got discord um come and join our discord if you want to contact me or you know have a say or have a conversation and a chat because it's it's a lot more kind of communal than than facebook anyway so um yeah you might want to have a look at that and the links for all of that is in the show notes so with that said anyway i say i just wanted to get that out there and so people are, are aware of what's going on you know i'm not just trying to like shut down conversation on the social media or anything it's it's, it's more or less out of my hands it's yeah facebook nonsense i don't really fully understand it to be honest but anyway moving on because you know let's crack on with this this is this week's episode it's called the barnes mystery kate webster's best dripping the thames torso murders are perhaps one of the most famous series of murders associated with the thames river in 19th century london linked as it always has been with the notorious jack the ripper killings of 1888 Four victims were pulled out of the water between the spring of 87 and the winter of 88, all dismembered and heavily mutilated. The mutilations and the proximity in time to the heavily documented Ripper murders, the Torso murders were known throughout the country. However, as Londoners that lived around the river knew all too well, the truth was that the vein of water that winds through the centre of the city was no stranger to scenes of the macabre, so often was it used for the disposal of bodies. If one were to pay close attention to the north end of the picturesque Tower Bridge, you can see a quiet alcove built into the river wall. This is known colloquially as Dead Man's Hole, and it operated as a mortuary in the 19th century, situated on the river's edge out of convenience due to the sheer number of bodies that washed up week after week. For almost as long as London has been home to its bursting population, the 215 mile long stretch of river has always been a popular scene of disposal for anyone with a body on their hands that they were looking to lose. In the 17th century, the river was seen as a natural plague pit and throughout the 18th and 19th century was simply a convenient dumping ground for anything and pretty much everything and by everyone, from murders to medical students. Matters were made all the worse in the mid-19th century when an act was passed prohibiting burials within central London due to overcrowded cemeteries following years of plague, cholera and overpopulation. During this time, private cemeteries were operated for those that could afford the luxury, but for pure disposal, once again, the Thames played its role as a mass dumping ground. 
One entrepreneurial and decidedly corrupt minister from Enon Chapel mixed the two when he took payment for burying bodies in a private burial ground and then proceeded to dump the lot in the Thames by the cartload the moment that his customers were out of earshot. This indiscriminate dumping eventually led to the Great Stink in 1858 that saw the government flood thousands of litres of chlorine into the river in attempts to clean up the filthy water that was by now causing such a stench through the city that it was no longer bearable and would ultimately lead to thousands of miles of new sewers being built. The publication of the likes of the London Police News and the Illustrated Police News in the mid-19th century helped to shine a light on the number of the bodies that were actually being pulled out of the river, with a new murder mystery story kicking off with the discovery of a body, either in full or in part, found floating down the Thames or washed up on the shoreline almost weekly. In October the 9th, 1857, the Waterloo Bridge mystery saw a body fished out of the water wrapped inside a carpet whilst the Thames mystery of 1873 launched into the press when a mutilated body was stumbled upon in the mud by Battersea Waterworks. The stories, in fact, are so overwhelmingly numerous that when I began researching for this section of the podcast, a search of the British newspaper archives for the phrase Thames and body during the years 1850 to 1899 brought up over 650,000 results. Of course, this does contain multiple results, but it's still a lot. And it's a trend that was never fully vanished. Even today, with all its security, CCTV and water processing, it's estimated that throughout the course of an average year, around a body per week is still fished out of the river. And so, it's with little surprise that when Henry Wheatley stumbled upon a box containing a mutilated corpse in the spring of 1879, the newspapers afforded it only a short column inch of reporting. Vague in its particulars, and sandwiched between various other stories of the day, the arrival of a member of the gentry in Dover, and the death of a football player from injuries sustained whilst on the pitch, it was more disturbing in its nonchalance than its graphic descriptions. It wasn't until a month later, when the details became better known, that the story would spiral into the limelight, challenging the Victorian ideals that propped up society day to day. It was 7am on the morning of the 5th of March 1879 when Henry Wheatley, a coal porter, was making his way to work along the banks of the Thames River with his partner opposite Barnes Terrace, just down from the Barnes Bridge, north of Richmond Park in southwest of London. The morning was a typical British springtime. A light fog was just starting to clear and light grey clouds struggled to hide a brilliant sunshine that would bring a much welcome warmth to the brisk morning breeze that whipped across Henry's seat on the horse-drawn coal cart. As the pair approached the bridge, Henry spotted something sticking half in and half out of the water, something that looked a little bit like a wooden box. Thinking it might be the proceeds of a burglary, he pulled the cart to an abrupt stop and jumping down, he skipped across the muddy bank to pull it out of the water and get a better look. When he reached the waterline, he found the box was of a relatively plain design, about a foot square with a lid and brass hinges wrapped in a corded rope. Grabbing it by its one remaining handle, he hauled it up to dry land and ran his knife across the rope, kicking the box open. The contents tumbled out onto the grass verge, various lumps of meat, each individually wrapped in brown paper. Henry's partner assumed they dredged up an old casket of butcher's meat, but Henry wasn't so sure. There were packages that looked a little bit too familiar, and they certainly didn't fit any animal. Taking a diversion to the Barnes police station, he reported his find just to be sure. That morning, Inspector Harbour was on duty to take the coal porter's report and he called for the doctor and made his way down to the river to take a look. Dr James Adams showed up soon after and inspected the lumps of flesh and just as Henry Wheatley had suspected, immediately declared it as human. They were found to consist of the upper part of the chest, the heart, the right lung and the right shoulder joint attached to the body and chest, a small portion of the bone of the upper arm being attached to the trunk. The left upper arm had been taken away from the shoulder. There was also a portion of the right leg which had been cut away below the hip joint. 
This had been hacked off and separated at the knee. There was also one other portion of the leg cut from under the knee and terminating at the ankle. Dr Adams had the remains removed to the Barnes Mortuary in Barnes Cemetery where he could make a proper inspection. Once set up in the mortuary, Adams found that it was almost the entire body of a human female, probably aged around 20 to 30 years old, and due to the absence of any significant decomposition, despite his estimates having it in the water between 6 to 10 days, thought that it appeared to have been boiled. Critically, for identification purposes, the head was entirely missing, as was one foot, which was less critical but no less curious. Initially, the police struggled with the remains, finding them to be something of a conundrum. There was some consideration at first that due to the boiled appearance, leading to suggestions that efforts had been carried out to preserve the flesh, the remains were potentially those of a medical nature, perhaps from an old anatomy lecture, or even left in the box as a prank by some twisted medical student. Counter to this theory, however, was the fact that the mutilations were reportedly carried out in what was described as an unskillful manner, which more or less undermined the entire line of thought. The inquest opened on Monday the 10th of March at the Red Lion Inn, headed by the coroner, Mr Hall. Due to the lack of any police leads and of the victim's head, a fact that made identification virtually impossible back in 1879, the only glimmer of information to be had was that the mutilations upon the body appeared to have been carried out after death and possibly with a blunt instrument. No cause of death could be assumed, as there were no signs of injury in life and no identification could be made, leaving the jury to conclude an open verdict after a week's adjournment. With police completely at a loss, the headlines in the press quickly hit print, calling the disturbing find the Barnes Mystery. The police weren't entirely clueless, however, and they had been out scouring the nearby parklands and knocking door to door in the hopes of uncovering a missing person from the local area for quite a while. A German maid was suspected of being the victim after she had suddenly left her position and she had failed to meet her new employer despite previous arrangements. There were even rumblings that she had owned a box that seemed to fit the description of the one dragged out of the river. It was all very exciting. However, within days the police tracked her down to a house in Weymouth where she'd taken a new job in the town. It was the end of the line for the police as they stood, but little did they know, they were well on the right track. Soon they would become aware of another maid, and one that would turn out to be a far more promising lead. Catherine Lawler was born in Killane, County Wexford, in Ireland around 1849. Brought up on a farm, surrounded by a family of Roman Catholics, she led a fairly chaotic early life. According to her own account, she was married to a sea captain named Webster and the mother of four children by the time that she was aged just 15. Her blossoming family life was cut short when apparently all four children and her husband died. The truth of this story is highly doubtful not only due to the shaky math that would allow her to have four children by such a young age, but also because Catherine, or Kate as she preferred to be called, was a known liar and thief. Unfortunately for Kate, whilst records of her supposed marriage and multiple childbirths seemingly don't exist, the records of her multiple arrests do. After serving a short prison sentence for conviction of larceny, she decided to move on from Ireland either in an attempt to start a new life or simply having eyes on bigger and better things. She continued to steal in order to raise the money and in 1867 she used the funds she'd scraped together through selling stolen goods to buy herself passage aboard a ship to Liverpool in England. Once in Liverpool, Kate apparently did try to start a new chapter but quickly she fell back into the old habits and began stealing from lodging houses. Within months of her arrival to the new city, she found herself back at the Assizes on further charges of larceny, for which she was convicted and sentenced to four years of imprisonment. She served three before being granted early release. After this release, it was clear to Kate that there was more to life than Liverpool, and so she moved down south to London, where she took several jobs, bouncing around the districts as a maid in general service and a charwoman. 
She struggled to settle for several years working in Notting Hill, Richmond and Hammersmith under the names of Kate Webb, Webster, Gibbs, Gibbons and Lawler. In 1873, whilst working and lodging in Rose Gardens, Hammersmith, she did seem to settle down some, making friends with her neighbours, the Porter family, and giving birth to a son who she named John. John was apparently fathered by a man Kate had been seeing, known only as Strong, though there were suggestions by those close to her that she'd been working the streets, once more casting Kate's dubious family background into complications. Whether or not the father of her child was this man known as Strong is impossible to ascertain. However, it's true that the pair had been having some kind of relationship, and when Strong quickly failed as a father, unable to support their newborn son, the pair slipped seamlessly back into their careers as serial thieves. In 1875, Kate was once more arrested, this time on no fewer than 36 charges of larceny that saw her back behind bars, serving two years in Wandsworth Prison in south-west London. I became very impoverished, forsaken by John's father, and committed crimes for the purpose of supporting myself and my child. Whilst imprisoned, John was placed into the care of Mrs Crease, a close friend of Kate's, who she had come to be familiar with through Strong, and upon her release, it was to Mrs Crease she once more turned to help to find a new job. This new leaf wasn't to last once more, however, and Kate continued to struggle to settle into a life of honest graft. Within two years, she was arrested once more and thrown into a cell for a further 12 months. Always keen to help, it was Mrs Crease who continued to try to find the best in Kate, or, at the very least, she felt sorry enough for John to do her best to straighten his mother out. Upon her release in 1878, Kate moved into Mrs Crease's apartment in Mitchell Road, Richmond, where her and her son stayed with the woman, and quickly she began having an affair with Mrs Crease's adult son. Mrs Crease worked for an elderly woman in a nearby Richmond residence at number 2 The Crescent, named Mrs Loder. Whilst Kate found her feet back outside of prison walls, she occasionally stepped in to work for Mrs Crease, covering for her from time to time, usually on Saturdays. Mrs Loder liked Kate enough, and she suggested that if she was looking for full-time work, perhaps she could work for her friend, Mrs Thomas, who was in need of a charwoman. Thomas, she said, was distinctly eccentric, but a nice old lady who, aside from getting vexed and putting out for no apparent reason, was pleasant enough. Perhaps it was a genuine urge from Kate to see herself right that she committed to visiting Mrs Thomas to see about the job under Mrs Loder's recommendation. Or perhaps it was the fact that Mrs Loder described the old lady as fond of dress and jewellery. Whichever way it was, Kate soon found herself taking on the position of maid in Mrs Thomas's house, number two Vine Cottages, in Richmond, on the 27th of January, 1879. At first, Kate got on quite well with her new mistress. She learnt that Mrs Thomas had previously worked as a schoolteacher in Kingston, London, until she married her second husband, John Thomas. Mr Thomas had died in 1873 and since then Mrs Thomas had been living in vine cottages alone. As usual, however, Kate soon found honest life a struggle to conform to. At first, I thought Mrs Thomas a nice old lady and I hoped that I might be comfortable and happy with her but I found her very trying and she used to do many things to annoy me during my work. When I had finished my work in my rooms She used to go over it again after me and point out places where she said I did not clean, showing evidence of a nasty spirit towards me. This sort of conduct towards me by Mrs Thomas made me feel an ill feeling towards her. Mrs Thomas's nasty spirit may not have been entirely imagined by Kate. She was the latest in a long line of servants who had taken a position under the strict mistress, only to struggle and eventually leave. It took Kate less than a week to hand in her notice. Tired of being bossed around by the old lady, the pair had an argument that ended with Kate and Mrs Thomas mutually agreeing on terminating her employment. Kate agreed to work until the end of the month in order for Mrs Thomas to find a suitable replacement. However, 
It was perhaps not only Mrs Thomas who had been showing a nasty spirit. Soon after Kate had arranged her leaving date, the elderly lady began seeking someone to stay in the house with her, telling her friends that she felt uneasy spending time alone with the maid. Most of them shrugged away her fears and put it down to her eccentricities, but eventually, through her church, she did manage to secure a short-term lodger who would stay in the house until the day of Kate's leaving. Kate had agreed to work until the 28th of February, and upon the same day, Mrs Thomas's temporary lodger took her leave. However, being a Friday, Kate asked Mrs Thomas if she could stay on for a few more days, as finding work and a place to stay over the weekend was always much more difficult than on a Monday. Against her better judgement, Mrs Thomas agreed. On Sundays, Kate would generally go back to Mrs Creases and visit her son, however on that Sunday, the 2nd of March, she chose instead to visit the local pub and get drunk. When she returned to Vine Cottages, she found Mrs Thomas dressed, ready to visit church, a devout Presbyterian. It was a practice that she did every Sunday. Mrs Thomas was angry at having been made to wait for her return from the tavern. With a frustrated Mrs Thomas and a drunk and most probably bitter Kate, the situation was soon cast headlong into a heated argument. She and myself were enraged and she became very agitated and left the house to go to church in that state, leaving me at home. Upon her return from church, before her usual hour, she came in and went upstairs. I went up after her and we had an argument which ripened into a quarrel, and at the height of my anger and rage, I threw her from the top of the stairs to the ground floor. She had a heavy fall. I felt that she was seriously injured, and I became agitated at what had occurred, lost all control of myself, and to prevent her screaming or getting me into trouble, I caught her by the throat, and in the struggle, she was choked. I threw her onto the floor. With a dull thud, Mrs Thomas's body hit the floor of the house, leaving Kate in a frenzied panic. Realising that she was likely to be in serious trouble if the body were discovered, she quickly set about covering up as much evidence of the crime as she could. I determined to do away with the body as best I could, I chopped the head from the body with the assistance of a razor which I used to cut through the flesh afterwards. I also used the meat saw and the carving knife to cut the body up with. I prepared the copper with water to boil the body to prevent identity and as soon as I had succeeded in cutting it up I placed it in the copper and boiled it. I opened the stomach with the carving knife and burned up as much of the parts as I could. I burned one part of the body after chopping it up and boiled the other. I think I boiled one of the feet. I emptied the copper, throwing the water away after having washed and cleaned the outside. I then put parts of the body into the little wooden box. During the whole of this time, there was nobody in the house but myself. When I looked upon the scene before me and saw the blood around my feet, the horror and dread I felt was inconceivable. I was bewildered, acted as if I was mad, and did everything I possibly could to conceal the occurrence, keep it quiet and everything regular, fearing the neighbours might suspect something had happened. I was greatly overcome, both from the horrible sight before me and the smell, and I failed several times in my strength and determination, but was helped on by the devil in this vital purpose. I remained in the house all night, endeavouring to clear up the place and clean away traces of the murder. The following day, Kate continued her clean-up job of the grim scene that she'd wrought upon the small cottage. She tossed as many of the removed bones from Mrs Thomas's body into the grate, burning them in the furnace, then wrapped as much of the boiled flesh as she could in brown paper, stuffing it into a small wooden box. The box served the purpose well enough, but there was not enough room for the final foot, nor the head of Mrs Thomas. However, Kate was wise enough to realise that it would be better to discard the two separately anyway. Tossing the decapitated head into a black cloth bag and leaving it in the kitchen for the time being, she took hold of the foot and set out on an early morning stroll, discarding the leftover limb on a manure heap in Kingston, pawning the old lady's dentures on her way back to Hammersmith for six shillings, which she quickly drank away in the pub before heading back home and continuing her cleaning operation. It was while she drank in the pub that one of the more disturbing rumours was born. As she got slowly more drunk, Kate apparently began offering for sale jars of her best drippings to the locals, 
Whilst it's unclear if anyone took her up on the offer, or if the event was actually true at all, it is true that police later found two jars of reduced human fat behind the fireplace in the kitchen. Back at the Thomas house, Kate continued cleaning as usual. In order to avoid arousing suspicion, she went about doing the laundry and continued to order the household goods, such as coal and groceries, from the servicemen that continued to visit, as well as propping up the washing line in order to hang the laundry, in full view of the neighbours, who suspected nothing despite noticing a slight off smell emanating from the kitchen of the house. There were a few tense moments. A coal porter knocked on the door seeking Mrs Thomas in order to settle an account on one morning and the neighbour of Mrs Thomas's landlord, Mrs Ives, sent her maid over in order to confirm a visit by a pair of builders in order to fix a leak in the roof. Kate made short work of shooing them all away, telling the coal porter that Mrs Thomas wasn't home and telling the maid that the builders were no longer necessary as the leak had not been such a big deal and appeared to have fixed itself. Tuesday the 4th of March saw Kate begin phase 2 of the clean-up plan that she'd been concocting whilst cleaning up the murder scene. Dressed in one of Mrs Thomas' silk dresses and wearing her gold bracelet, watch and a selection of her gold rings, Kate grabbed up the black bag containing her old mistress's decapitated head and paid a visit to the Porter family, whom she had been on friendly terms with when she had lived in Rose Gardens in Hammersmith six years earlier. Though she hadn't spoken to them in such a long time, she greeted them at the door like old friends. This may have seemed strange and one could imagine Mr Porter racking his brain for who the visitor was, which would have been made all the more difficult when Kate introduced herself as Kate Thomas rather than Webster. Since their last meeting, Kate told him over tea, she had gone on to marry a respectable man named Mr Thomas, though he had unfortunately recently passed, leaving her a wealthy widower. To complicate the lies, she also told them that recently her aunt had died, leaving her another property in Richmond, which needed to be disposed of in order for her to break ties with the city and return to her family home in Scotland. The purpose of her visit to the porter's home that day was to seek out a broker who might be interested in buying the entire contents of the house. As she calmly sat and explained all this, drinking tea, hammering out a deal for Mrs Thomas's furniture and belongings, she rested the bag containing the old woman's head against her leg under the table. Completely fooled by Kate's airs and graces, Mr Porter agreed to introduce her to a broker and then he and his 16-year-old son, Robert, accompanied her back to Richmond Station. Robert, the young gentleman that he was, insisted that he carry Kate's heavy black bag, much to her panic. After a tense walk, the trio stopped into the Oxford and Cambridge Arms pub for a quick drink, at which point Kate told the porters that she must nip out to meet a friend who was to be collecting the black bag from her. Kate disappeared for 20 minutes before returning, apparently the deal complete as the bag containing Mrs Thomas's head was no longer in her possession. At Hammersmith station, Mr Porter returned home, leaving Robert to complete the journey with Kate back to Richmond. When they arrived back at Vine Cottages, Kate requested the young man's help once more. Collecting the box containing the carved up body of Mrs Thomas from the kitchen, she asked him to help her carry it over to Richmond Bridge, where she told him that she had arranged to meet another friend who would be collecting the box. Together the pair heaved it along the side of the Thames in another tense journey, until they reached the halfway point of the bridge. Kate assured Robert that he should continue along the bridge alone, and insisted that she would meet her friend and catch him up at the far end after the meeting was over. As he walked ahead a short distance, the young man heard a loud splash, but looking into the water below, saw nothing that gave away what it might have been. Shortly after, Kate met Robert Sands Box, the meeting apparently having gone as planned. Feeling like she had completed a job well done, Kate invited Robert back to Mrs Thomas's house, and with the old lady now floating in the Thames, the two drank rum until midnight. Over the following week, Kate ran the Thomas's house as she always had. The only difference that the old lady was no longer around to pester her, and she now did the chores in fine dresses that once belonged to her old mistress. That weekend, she visited the porters once more and was introduced to John Church, 
a 41-year-old broker who owned a small private cafe bar named The Rising Sun in Hammersmith. Church settled on a price of £50 for the house clearance, paying Kate £13 up front as a deposit. Over the following days, Church and Porter assisted in indexing, wrapping and preparing the contents for removal. The entire time, Kate explaining to them how she had come to possess the certain items, and even declaring a painted portrait of a man above the fireplace as her deceased husband, Mr Thomas, which it most definitely was not. Things were all progressing smoothly for Kate, the only ropey moment being one afternoon when she was bargaining with Church as a paperboy passed by the house, yellowing a headline into the street. Supposed murder, shocking discovery of human remains in a box in the Thames. Shrugging the headline off as sensationalist rubbish, she bought a copy and ushered the paperboy along on his way. Managing to play the moment with a straight poker face, the afternoon quickly returned to talk of furniture without so much as a hint of suspicion on the part of church. And so, things continued to progress smoothly, at least until the removal cart arrived on Tuesday the 18th of March. Upon seeing the men ferrying Mrs Thomas's possessions out of the house and loading them onto the cart in the street, Mrs Thomas's neighbour and, awkwardly, her landlord, Mrs Ives, went out to the cart's driver and asked what was going on. The driver replied that he was waiting to remove the belongings under Mrs Thomas's orders. So, addressing Kate directly, Mrs Ives frustratedly asked the maid where Mrs Thomas was. It would have been a somewhat curious moment when, her guile quickly failing under the pressure, the woman known as Mrs Thomas to all around her simply replied, I don't know. Finding the answer to be wholly unacceptable, Mrs Ives stormed off back to her house, mumbling that she would be sure to inquire further into this matter. Kate, clearly flustered by the awkward scene, decided to cut her losses. With £7 in cash that she had removed from Vine Cottages, along with the £13 deposit that she would received from church, she made a beeline for the porter's home, where her son John was staying, and collected him before skipping aboard a train to St Pancras Station to Liverpool. Once there, she booked a passage aboard a coal steamer to Ireland, heading as quickly as she could for her uncle's farm, back in her hometown of Killane. It was a colossal mistake, driven by sheer panic, as she would soon find out. After Kate's sudden disappearance, Mr Church quickly grew suspicious of the transaction that he'd arranged with the absent homeowner. Placing a halt on the removal, he aired his suspicions with Mr Porter, who also confirmed that he'd also found the so-called Mrs Thomas's disappearance to be pretty fishy. Church's wife had previously found a letter in one of the dresses that she'd removed from the cart, along with a selection of jewellery that Kate, in her hurry to leave, had forgotten to remove. The letter was from a man named Mahenik, and so Mr Church and Porter sought him out, only to find out that Mahenik never knew anyone by the name of Thomas confirming that he had written the letter to a woman named Kate Webster. With the penny slowly dropping and suspicions quickly rising, Church and Porter decided to take it to the police station, where they reported their story. The inspectors at the station interviewed the two men and called on the young Robert Porter to come in and ID the box that the coal porter Henry Wheatley had found in the Thames several weeks prior. It was a lead, perhaps, with only a slim chance. But then, Robert Porter arrived at the station and confirmed that the box was the very same one that he'd helped Kate carry to the Richmond Bridge. As a story quickly developed of the murder, police published a description of Kate in hopes of tracking her down. Wanted for stealing plate, etc. and supposed murder of mistress, Kate, aged about 32, 5 foot 5 or 6 inches high, complexion sallow, slightly freckled, teeth rather good and prominent, usually dressed in dark dress, jacket rather long and trimmed with dark fur round pockets, light brown satin bonnet, speaks with Irish accent and was accompanied by boy aged five, complexion rather dark, dark hair, was last seen at Hammersmith. As it happened, it wasn't altogether necessary as when the police conducted a search of number two vine cottages, they found, along with the burned bones in the fireplace and bloodstains under the floorboards, a letter from Kate's uncle in Ireland, 
complete with return address. In Kate's rush to leave, she had left a trail that led directly to her. Within days, she was arrested on her uncle's farm by two inspectors from London, John Dowdle and John Jones, charging her with the murder of Mrs. Thomas, as well as stealing her furniture and property. She was transported back to London via Dublin and placed in prison to await trial. Throughout the journey back to London and while she sat in her prison cell, Kate remained calm, composed and relaxed. If it was a facade, it was expertly carried out and it was certainly not reflected across the country as the public quickly jumped aboard the press sensation. The concept of a woman murderer in Victorian England was spectacle enough but a murderer who had so savagely mutilated her victim's body? It was pure scandal and headline entertainment. For hundreds of years prior to the Victorian period, women had helped to run businesses, brew ale and work in storefronts, but with the ever-growing industrialisation and the boom in the resulting middle classes, a new role for women emerged, tightly wrapped in a shift in the fundamental concept of gender roles and the emerging ideology of two spheres teaching that men and women existed in two separate worlds. The natural characteristics of women and men were tightly defined and achingly simple. Women were physically weaker than men and considered as secondary to the male patriarch of the household, but, far from unimportant, they were considered crucial to any healthy home due to their moral superiority to men, which far outstripped their opposite. The main role of a woman in the home, therefore, was no longer one of physical support, but of mental, counterbalancing the moral cesspit that the man of the house toiled in from day to day. It was a tough job, and it required no small amount of rigid protocol. A woman was expected to have knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, embroidery, as well as constantly maintaining the highest order of manners, speech and etiquette. All of this went into providing the house with a mysterious, feminine air, vague in its notion but strict in its demands. Even fashions changed to reflect this new role, with descriptions and illustrations of large, thoroughly impractical ballooning skirts, hats at jaunty angles and lace gloves featuring weekly in the women's pages of the newspapers that centred on fashion, recipes and guidance for understanding the domestic role. Sex was strictly for the purpose of procreation, one of the main roles of the housewife as provider, along with a clean home and food on the table, and any decent woman was expected to be practically asexual in their behaviour, thoroughly uninterested in the vulgar concepts of sexual gratification. Sexual, professional or educational ambition was not only out of bounds, but viewed with utter disdain. It goes without saying, then, that none of these restrictions were applicable to men who, trapped in their moral turmoil, were expected to fill their boots. Divorce, after all, was not an option. Feminism was still far away on the horizon, and most efforts were ridiculed, shown public hostility, and dismissed right up until the late 19th century. Working-class women, who were forced into working in the worst conditions and in difficult jobs in order to survive, were viewed in a patronising light as victims, poor creatures who had suffered at the hands of society and could only aspire to climb to the lofty heights of the middle-class domestic angel. It is through this lens that Victorian female murderers were viewed, and as such, they were seen as a total perversion of social norms. In the case of Kate Webster, who had not only murdered, but then savagely butchered her victim, she was viewed as far away from the Victorian ideal of womanhood as could possibly be. In true circus freak nature, her crime was to the public as sensational and freakish as any bearded lady or Fiji mermaid, and it aroused equal interest and excitement. Following her arrest in Ireland, Kate immediately sought to wriggle out from guilt and land those around her in prison for her crime. She asked her arresting officers if they had anyone else in custody for the murder yet, and when they replied in the negative, she told them, There ought to be. The innocent should not have to suffer for the guilty. Leaving the cryptic line hanging in the air, while she attempted to think her way out of the predicament she now found herself in. During the train ride, she began winding her story that she would continue all the way into her official statement in London, 
telling her captors and the jury at her pre-trial hearing that it was all John Church, a man that she'd known for over seven years, who had frequently taken her out to buy her drinks and alluding to a relationship that stepped well past the line of mere broker. On the Sunday evening of the murder, after a few drinks, Church, she said, had suggested putting the old woman out of the way. Kate, for whatever reason, left Church alone in the house, returning later to find him in the throes of murdering Miss Thomas. She wove the story with small details of truth, and combined with the fact that Church did have a selection of Mrs. Thomas's possessions at his home, the police had little choice but to arrest him on suspicion of murder. Fortunately for Church, he had an alibi, and it was one that was pretty much watertight. On the night that Kate told police he had murdered Mrs. Thomas, it turned out that he had in fact been chairing a meeting at a social club. Not only could his alibi be confirmed by every single member who had seen him there that night, but he'd also signed into the club's membership book too. Once again, Kate had come up with a plan that seemingly addressed minute details, but skipped over the largest, rendering her plan a colossal failure. Realising the statement was being written off by the police, she decided to make a second several days later, this time in an attempt to incriminate Mr. Porter instead, saying that he had also been involved in the murder, moving the date of the crime back a day, in all likelihood in the hope it would bypass Church's alibi. By now, however, Kate's statements weren't really fooling anyone, and no further arrests were made. Quickly, the case against Church was thrown out, and public opinion turned sharply against Kate, whose carriage was booed all the way to and from Newgate Prison to the courthouse on each occasion. By now, the investigation into the murder was very much a form of popular entertainment, and people travelled all the way to Ireland to see the farmhouse that she was arrested on, as well as lining the streets outside the courthouse in hopes of catching a glimpse of the murderess butcher and join in with the heckling. By the time of Kate's trial opening, on the 2nd of July 1879, Kate was well and truly a public enemy. She appeared in court looking exceedingly pale and careworn, a description that starkly contrasted her earlier appearances where she made statements in front of the magistrates looking composed and jaunty. Despite the fact that it was a fairly straightforward affair, with a long stream of witnesses making damning statements against her, the trial was a long, protracted affair, lasting a full six days, a situation that was incredibly rare in the Victorian era when trials of even two days were considered long. Every day attracted a large audience from all levels of society, and it was even rumoured that the Crown Prince of Sweden was in the crowd at one point, attracted by the gory details of the murder. In the closing statements, Kate's defence pushed the questions that the cause of death could not be properly determined and therefore proof of violence was not necessarily assured and also upon the possibility of doubt as to whose ashes they were that were found in the furnace following the murder. It was as weak an appeal as it sounds and the prosecution made a savage rebuke in its closing speech on the final day of the trial pointing out that the fact that the bones, the box, the cleaning of the house and the whole host of other details, large and small, all pointed to something and that that something was most assuredly not anything of an innocent nature. The jury seemingly agreed with the prosecution and they made short work returning a guilty verdict after just under an hour and a quarter's deliberation. When asked if she had anything to say as to why the court should not carry out judgment, Kate merely blathered on about a new character, the mysterious father of her son, who she now blamed for everything, including the murder. I am not guilty, my lord, of the murder. I have never done it, my lord. When I was taken into custody, I was in a hurry and I made a statement against Church and Porter. I am very sorry for doing so, and I want to clear them out of it. And another thing, I was led to this, my lord. The man who is guilty of all of this is not in the case at all nor never was. Therefore, I do not see why I should suffer for what other people have done. There was a child put in my hands in 1874. I had to thieve for that child and go to prison for it, which can be brought to your lordship. Anybody can tell it round Kingston or Richmond too. Therefore, the father of that child is the ruin of me since 1873 up to this moment, and he is the instigation of this. He was never taken into custody. I have cherished him up to this minute, but I do not see why I should suffer for a scoundrel who has left me after what he has done. 
The judge replied curtly that her statement will not warrant me one moment from hesitating to pass upon you the sentence of the law. Kate immediately made a plea of pregnancy, a plea that would see her execution suspended until after childbirth if true, but after an inspection by a matron, it was instantly shot down and discarded. She left the court, headed for the gallows, much to the excitement of the Bayon public. Following the trial, Kate Webster was removed to Wandsworth Prison to await her execution. It was during the long days, awaiting the gallows, that she finally made her third statement, largely considered to contain the majority of the truth, including her graphic depiction of the murder. The statement still did its best to paint her in a polished light, one that attempted to seek the sympathies of the public. When I got into trouble in Liverpool, it was owing in a great measure to poverty and evil associations, which led me step by step into badness. When I got over that trouble, I formed an intimate acquaintance with one who should have protected me, and being led away by evil associates and bad companions, I became, as it were, forlorn, and forsook everything that might have kept me in the path of rectitude and prevented my unhappy end. I did not murder Mrs. Thomas from any premeditation. I was enraged and in a passion, and I can now recollect why I did it. Something seemed to seize me at the time. I threw her downstairs in the heat of passion and strong impulse. I acted towards her as I have described. I never had a hatred or what may be termed a bad feeling towards anybody in my lifetime, certainly not such as would ever have induced me to do them bodily injury. And I cannot account for the awful feelings that came over me from the time Mrs. Thomas came home from church until the murder was completed. It was all to no avail, however, and on the morning of her execution, on the 29th of July 1879, a limited crowd gathered around the walls of Wandsworth Prison. By 1879, executions were no longer carried out in public, but a high-profile case like Kate's would invariably attract a crowd who would hope to spy some of the execution from outside the prison walls. The public sale of her possessions the following day was a truer representation of the sensation that the case had sparked in the public, and it was attended by a large crowd of onlookers and buyers, as items right down to the knives used into the dissection of Mrs. Thomas were sold to any member of the public who cared to bid. The papers reported on the execution, calling Kate one of the worst women the century had produced. They called her a notably bad base woman, and her touch, contamination itself. Her case was such a scandal and provoked enough attention that Kate was eventually immortalised in the Hall of Killers in Madame Tussaud's waxworks. In a bizarre modern twist, the head of Mrs Thomas showed up 131 years later in the back garden of naturalist and TV presenter Sir David Attenborough. In 2010, during building works and an extension to his house in Richmond, built on the site of an old Victorian pub known as the Hole in the Wall, builders stumbled across a cracked and shattered skull buried deep in the ground. Calling in police, who further arranged for an excavation, the investigation, led by acting Detective Inspector David Bolton, took almost eight months. There were some clues such as the Victorian-era tiles that lay on the ground around the skull and the number of missing teeth. Forensics also employed radiocarbon dating, as well as a number of forensic investigations of various historical records, including dental, finally allowing the coroner to confirm that it was indeed the skull of Mrs. Thomas. The discovery of the skull closed the curtain on the final thread of mystery that had eluded contemporary investigations at the time of the original murder. A murder that was undoubtedly savage, but in Victorian England, with gender roles as they were, it was indescribably perverse. Murders like that of Mrs. Julia Thomas were almost seen as something of a personal affront to the goodly public. In truth, it was actually far less unusual than it may seem. The Victorian period is littered with female murderers who ran the gamut from cool, calculated serial killers to violent crimes of passion fueled rage. It does seem likely, however, that her case was the only one that saw a decapitated head taken to a tea party and then hidden, lost for over a century. And that was The Trial of Kate Webster. Quite a 
savage little Victorian murder we got going on there. So, yeah, we'll chat a little bit about some of the bits and pieces that I sort of came across whilst I was researching that after these short advert breaks. Thanks for listening to Dark Histories. This podcast is entirely independent and funded by myself and listener support. So in order to do that, I need to run a few ads. Our long-time advertising partner is Audible, and the reason I've stuck with them for so long is that they offer a service that I actually use and enjoy myself. And I do think it actually offers value to people like myself who enjoy podcasts. If you're unaware of what Audible is, it's an audiobook subscription service which charges a monthly fee in return for one credit, which you're free to spend on any audiobook you like. The catalogue is huge, multilingual, and covers everything from fiction to series of lectures. They have an iOS, Android and web app, and if you use more than one, they all sync up together so that you can listen on any of your devices without having to skip about. If you ever feel like you want to take a break from the subscription, you can do so and you get to keep all your previously bought books. And when you get into a drought, you can just fire it up again and start gaining credits seamlessly. Some of my favourite books on there to date are The Complete Sherlock Holmes, which is read by Stephen Fry. And they've also got the original Exorcist book and just a huge history back catalogue. And I've really enjoyed all of those, basically. So if this sounds like something you might be interested in, head over to audible.com forward slash dark histories, and that's dark histories all one word. And you can start a free trial that offers a monthly subscription with one free credit so that you can instantly pick an audiobook of your choice. If at the end of the trial, you feel like it's not really for you, you can just cancel it and it's cost you nothing and you get to keep your free book. So once again, that's audible.com forward slash dark histories or you can find the link in the show notes. So earlier I mentioned listener support, and there are a ton of ways that you can get involved and support Dark Histories. The main way is to become a Patreon patron. If you listen to a lot of podcasts, I'm sure you're familiar by now, but for those not so much, Patreon is a way to make a monthly pledge in return for some small perks. On the Dark Histories Patreon, I set my pledges as low as I can, really, with options for one, three, and five dollars per month. And for that, you gain things like early access episodes without these horrible ads, PDF notes, and resources that I make and find during my research for each episode. There's also access to the live stream archives and more. So if you enjoy the show and you think it's worth it to you, hop over to darkhistories.com and you can find all the ways that you can support, including our Patreon, or just check out the links in the show notes. If none of that appeals, then sharing it around with all your friends and family is equally as helpful and just as much appreciated. So if you're here, then thanks so much for not skipping the ads with that 30 second skip button and giving my hard sell a listen. I'll let you get back to the episode. Cheers. Welcome back. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. It's quite an interesting case, this one. Um, I it's funny enough. I, I I actually came across it whilst I was um, doing uh, which one was it? The Euston Square murder, I believe, because the cases overlapped and the Hannah Dobbs um, trial was more or less at the same time and and had some overlap in terms of the investigations. So I I came across this one when I was doing the research originally for the Euston Square murder, which was a long time ago. As I was researching the other one, I remember reading into this one and then thinking like, oh, okay, I'll put this one to one side for later. So yeah, that's that's pretty much how I came about that, which I thought was kind of an interesting coincidence. But anyway, um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Not too much to talk about, I, I suppose. Um, I suppose it's just interesting, you know, that the, the gender roles of this episode, you know, like the the whole, I mean, obviously every mutilation case had a certain amount of sensationalism behind it, but quite often sort of here today, gone tomorrow. They, they, the stories had like very little longevity. Like if you read the papers, they tend to be, yeah, they might make the headline in the illustrated police news this week, but another one will be there next week. And, and this week's one will be forgotten. They, they, they very rarely have like longevity, the, the, these kind of cases in, in Victorian London. It's it's only the ones that sort of cause like a real great degree of sort of 
con- controversy or, or sensationalism that, that really have the longevity. And, and it's, I say, like, like this case. But it's interesting that I, I don't think this case probably would have had that longevity if it wasn't the fact that it was a woman. Um, and so I found that really interesting how it was almost heightened, like everything about this case was heightened because it was a woman and, and women were not expected to, you know, behave in this manner. You know, women were expected to be morally righteous and these kind of like domestic goddess angels that were, you know, morally better than murder. And so, you know, when you had, you know, this is the reason why, you know, a lot of female murderers were sort of sensational at the time. But when you had one like this, that was like so kind of brutal and savage in its kind of mutilation, you know, it it just kind of blew apart society really, because it was so against, you know, it really sort of picked at the seams and well, I mean, it didn't pick at the seams, did it? It literally tore the seams open of society and, you know, displayed the innards for everyone to see. Um, so I found that really interesting, that that sort of side of this this week's episode, um, which is, I suppose, why I tried to sort of focus it around that sort of aspect, because so I th- that was the aspect that I found most interesting. But, yeah, thanks very much for listening. Say, there's not any mystery, really, so I'll probably leave that there. If you'd like to contact me, you can do so. I say, I would, like I said at the start, I probably wouldn't use Facebook at the moment. Um, you can contact me um, in email, contact at darkhistories.com, or I'm on Instagram, on Twitter. All the links can be found either in the show notes or on darkhistories.com. You'll also be, found, be able to find ways to support the podcast if you want to do that. And there'll also be the, say, if you are interested in the community aspect um, and, you know, you, you want to go to Facebook for the community aspect and to talk to people about episodes or that sort of thing, check out the Discord. Um, and there's links for that again in the um, show notes and, and on the website, darkissues.com. So, yeah, check that out if you would like to. Otherwise, thank you very much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. I'll see you again in a couple of weeks for the next episode. Thank you very much. Cheers. Sleep tight.